Page 94, the Private Eye podcast. Hello and welcome back to Page 94. My name is Andrew Hunter-Murray and this is our third special episode. This is our Between Series trilogy of special episodes, which is not to be confused with an actual series. It's more of a Between Series series. In this episode, we're going to be discussing lots of local things. Later on, we'll be talking to Tim Minogue of Rotten Boroughs about his fantastic interactive map of naughty councillors. Uh, it is extremely exciting, possibly not in the way you're now thinking. But first of all, you may have noticed a couple of issues ago, we had a special report uh, about the crimes of Gordon Anglesey, who was a senior police officer who's very recently been convicted uh, of the sexual abuse of vulnerable young men in his care. Uh, it was a historic case, and it's one that the eye had a special interest in because he sued us uh, for libel in the 1990s, Uh, And he won at the time. Ian Hislop, the editor of Private Eye, joins me now. Ian, is that a fair assessment of the situation? Yes, um, that is right. And um, it was a very grim case and uh, we lost, um, along with a number of other media organisations. And uh, the damages were huge and the costs were even bigger. But um, that wasn't the worst cost. I mean, the worst cost was that a young man who'd given evidence for us took his own life. So it couldn't have been a sort of less amusing um, or less sort of entertaining case for Private Eye to take. And we lost. It was a very long time ago, but it's always slightly rankled. And the judge had summed up in the eye's favour, which didn't happen very often um, in cases, and we'd still lost. And I ran into him later in life, I mean, actually just before he died. And he said, how on earth did you lose that case? And um, I thought, well, you know, you should know you were the judge. So it took a very long time. And when I heard that he'd been arrested under this new operation, I thought, well, the least we could do is actually send a reporter down there uh, to cover the whole thing. Jane McKenzie is one of Private Eye's team who write for In the Back, and she attended the whole trial and found that, among other things, court reporting in the UK is becoming an endangered species. In total, including the days that were full days of legal argument and the days that the jury were out, it ran to nearly seven weeks. Seven weeks. I mean, that's longer than most trials, isn't it? Of its kind, yes. I mean, you know, fraud trials run significantly longer, but um, certainly when I was a trainee journalist a long time ago I used to work for a local paper we had people in court every single day both at the magistrates court and the crown court Um, whatever came up there was somebody there to ensure that those hearings took place truly in public so that the public could read about them afterwards. A lot of Court reporting has been cut for reasons of expense or people feel it doesn't generate enough um, copy. But I thought, well, in this case, I mean, you know, he could have been acquitted and we could have uh, put Jane down there for weeks and weeks and got no copy out of it at all. But I thought we should do this because it was one of those stories that at the time I thought, well, have we got this wrong? You know, we have been found against in a court. It's worth going and looking at it properly. Did you think that you were wrong the first time after the initial trial? I mean, they're they're always grim um, cases involving uh, sexual abuse and uh, they tend to be remembered much later by two people who are in a room together. There is no paper trail, um, there is no other evidence, there aren't witnesses. It's very, very difficult in all these cases and the eye in the years has reported on historical allegations that weren't true and historical allegations that were true. Um, So it's not a state of mind. So there is always some doubt, there is always a worry. But I had believed the boys who'd um, made these claims and we'd all believed them at at the magazine and um, we'd run this piece along with various others. And it was uh, extraordinary 22 years later to get a verdict. But uh, I got very little satisfaction from it, nor any overwhelming desire to uh, say, oh, I must go and get all our money. I mean, it's sort of... I didn't really feel that's what it was about. I think you mentioned that even in this case, the Gordon Anglesey trial, the fact that the trial was being reported led to somebody else coming forward. had a major effect, yes. A reader of the Wrexham Leader newspaper actually came forward, having read a story about what was happening in the trial. The Wrexham Leader reader um, had, in fact, bought a copy of the local paper um, to read on his holidays. So he, he bought it and... Took it with him, so he's he's sitting, uh, I'm not quite sure whether he was next to a pool, but he was sitting <laughs> on holiday, reading the, the paper, and he comes across the court report 
detailing some of the material um, from the trial about um, Gordon Anglesey at the Attendance Centre for Young Offenders. And this man, it turned out, had himself been a young offender in his teens. He'd put, he'd put it all past him and become a respectable Wrexham citizen. And he read the detail in which Gordon Anglesey had said, no, I was never present in the, in the shower area. And he was able to say, well, hang on a minute. I was there and I remember it. And he was there and he was looking at us in the showers. And that was his contribution to the trial. He didn't say he abused me. He didn't say anything beyond that. But what he was able to say was, the complainant is right, Gordon Anglesey is wrong. And that was material they didn't have at the start of the trial. They only had because it appeared in the local paper. And this man read it and thought, well, I have something to say. We've been doing this a bit recently. Um, We did it with Deep Cut in which Heather Mills, who has covered a lot of this case over the years, literally went and just sat in court every day during the inquest. It was incredibly interesting, and we got a much fuller version of the story by having someone there the whole time. And again, we did this with um, the phone hacking trial, where poor Adam McQueen had to spend you know, about uh, half of his life uh, sitting there listening to this evidence. But again, because court reporting is, is not done hugely... If you make the investment, then it tends to um, provide quite rich dividends. Quite often um, these days there will be the judge, there will be the barristers, there will be the defendant, there may or may not be a jury depending on the type of hearing and, and nobody else will really hear what's going on at all. So although it's a public hearing, it's not because the public don't have access to it unless the media are there to tell them about it. In the absence of the media, the court publishes... The results of the trials, though, I presume. Where? It's actually quite difficult for somebody to find, I mean, without sort of applying to the courts for the details. For your average burglary case or something like that, that, that's not of major interest, sort of, there's nobody famous involved, there's simply, you've been burgled, your burglar has been up in court, you as, as a victim would be told, but. That's about it. Obviously, that's partly to do with uh, the cuts that have been made to local journalism all around the country. But is that also to do with the courts? Is there a way that they could be making it easier for members of the public to find out? There are various accessibility pilots that have been tried. I mean, it's certainly a major development. Is If a case is big and exciting, then there may be somebody even there live tweeting it. But again, that doesn't really help the sort of small town magistrates court um, where there's probably nobody that obsessive unless they're being paid by a local paper to go and sit in and live tweet the court hearing. And just to go back to this case for a moment, the Anglesey Mm. trial, um, this was slightly unusual in the way that it was uh, investigated. Is that right? So the operation that led to um, Anglesey's arrest was run by the National Crime Agency, not by the local police force. Um, The National Crime Agency is sort of like Britain's FBI. Um, I don't think they're as as well known. They they do a lot of the sort of big complex investigations. And in this case, they were called in by North Wales police. Why is that? Because a lot of the allegations around the historic abuse in in North Wales, not just Anglesey, there's a sort of whole um, dark history around the people involved in running um, children's care in North Wales, several of whom have have gone to jail. And allegations around that related to questions of the original investigations, because they had been reported in the 1980s, investigations and the 90s, and investigations had happened, but information had gone astray and this kind of thing. So there was a suggestion that nobody would trust a North Wales Police invest- reinvestigation at this point. So they, they invited the National Crime Agency to come in. The National Crime Agency set up Operation Pallial, which was absolutely immense in the terms of the number of documents, the number of complainants they've dealt with, the number of people who they've interviewed and arrested. and they've, There's still pending trials in Operation Pallial. This isn't the end of it. And what prompted 
Operation Pallio? Was it just a sense that these things had been inadequately investigated? Was there a particular trigger? Because it's 22 years since the first Anglesey case, and that was based on articles published over the previous few years. Yes. And this goes back to the 80s. I mean, one of the the triggers was the sort of kicking off of all these sex abuse cases uh, in relation to Jimmy Savile and the suggestion that major establishment figures were involved in all the child abuse rings and the like. In a way, it's never gone away. Does Operation Pallio, you think, mark some kind of point of closure for a lot of these cases? I think for some of the people involved, this will be a real sense of closure, yes. They've finally been able to speak out, be listened to, be believed, and speak in public in in front of a courtroom is a huge deal. Jane McKenzie there. Now, you may also have seen, featured in the magazine recently, a new, exciting digital extrusion of Private Eye uh, into the cybersphere, uh, which is our map of naughty councillors. This is an innovation that Tim Minogue of Rotten Boroughs thought of. It's a map of councillors who have not paid their council tax across the entire country. Here is Tim on exactly how the map came about. There's a very good and tenacious local reporter uh, called Dale Haslam and he was um, until recently the chief reporter of the Bolton News and he'd been following up a story he found out that some councillors in Bolton had not paid their council tax he was keen to find out who they were and the council wouldn't tell him because they said that was sensitive private information and Going on from that, he started to research how many other councillors at other places weren't paying, and he talked to us about it, and we said, yeah. Tim came to me with this idea, saying, I've got an idea for something digital, and I obviously said, no, uh, that won't be any good. He said, no, 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 this one is good. Uh, The idea is very, very simple, even you will get it, which was that, you know, local councillors expect you to pay your tax, they're not very sympathetic if you don't, And yet there appear to be lots of uh, local councillors who haven't paid theirs. Why could that be? And then he explained that sometimes they um, try and make sure you don't know whether they have paid or not. And that amazingly, at a local level, people are not hugely transparent. And I thought, oh, all right, this is quite a good idea. So, Tim, if you go to private-i.co.uk forward slash councillors, what will you see? If you click on your council area... It may say, all the councillors paid their council tax, there's no problem. Lovely. It may say that a certain number of councillors hadn't paid and had to be sent reminders, and then they paid and there's no problem, and then it escalates through, if they had two reminders and they didn't pay, they get a summons to court, and they have the option then to pay or to have the case go to court. I mean, they don't end up in the dock or anything, but the, the case is processed um, it, but if for any reason they still haven't paid and it's coming round to the council's budget setting uh, meeting, which is the most important financial decision they take in the year, then those councillors, not unreasonably, are barred from taking part or voting on those financial decisions. Because if they haven't paid theirs, why should they legislate on other people? And so it, it tells you in various gradations... How naughty your councillors have been. How basically. naughty... Or not. Or nice. The, the, the council, your councillors of being. And I think what happened uh, throughout the country at the end of that process was that uh, 16 councillors in all were barred from voting because they were really persistent non-payers. Wow. And we should say that sometimes people can't pay because of you know serious <coughs> financial circumstances that they're in or whether it might be bereavements or ill health of a member of the family or things like this. This is absolutely right. We... We shouldn't be proclaiming from the rooftops that these councillors are all tax dodgers or crooked in some way. I mean, it is, it is absolutely true that, like anybody else, they can get into financial difficulties. That is still not an argument for covering up and hiding the names of people. So we've now had a map of property and land that's owned by offshore companies. We've had a map of naughty councillors. We've had a podcast now going for about 20 episodes. This is all starting to look a bit digital first. I don't know how far this can extend, but I thought it, I thought perhaps we could have a map of all the places that Pilotti's written about that have mysteriously burnt down. Yeah, that would be fun, actually. Little flame icons yes. all over the place, yeah. It's been interesting looking at the local press this week because um, 
you know we do the research and then they follow them up and uh, it's it's obviously very good stories for for local papers and um, in some cases uh, when we asked under foi who hadn't paid and so on the the councils uh, still held to confidentiality and of course that's a great spur for if you're a local paper reporter you want to get onto it and find out who they were and um in Cornwall, the leader of the independent group there, very creditably, before he was outed, he, he sort of popped up and said, it, it was me, and now everybody's slapping him on the back for being such an honest guy, which is very good. And then uh, in other places, people who were named, the local press have gone to them and said, well, how, how come you owed all this money? Why didn't you pay? And um, there were some very good answers there. In, in uh, Lewis District Council in Sussex, there was a, a Tory called uh, Robbie Robertson, um, he'd been taken to court before paying uh, nearly a thousand pounds he owed, and the uh, local paper, the Argus, asked him why it had taken him so long to pay, and he said, um, "I want to see how the system worked." <laughs> it's also the same spirit of inquiry that uh, motivated a councillor Hurrell in um, Essex at Council Point, and he owed uh, fourteen hundred and sixty quid and he'd withheld it, he told the Basildon Echo, to test the council about the legality of council tax. Very high-minded, <laughs> excellent. But the best one I liked was in Newcastle. There was a Lib Dem called Robin Ashby. He owed, ooh, £2,229. And his explanation was very simple. It was a balls up, he said. <laughs> certainly was in general what are the responses like to stories that you publish because you have sort of favorite councillors or favorite executives that sometimes you'll return to over and over but what kind of responses do the pieces prompt is it frequently denials is it other people writing saying oh yes i know and one more thing about this person very often when we write about people we've exposed something quite bad that's gone on um we get silence i mean there was a councillor a few weeks ago called mr heimers and he was the tory councillor in charge of finance at a council in cumbria eden council i believe it was somebody wrote to us uh, mr heimers had been to the the one of the queen's garden parties in june and he was boasting about it on his website because his his company was so fantastic and he was such a good employer and um, somebody was a bit irate to see this because this person was a, a, I think a supplier of his company and they'd never got paid and they said did you know that his company uh, went bust and it actually owes £400,000 to Her Majesty's uh, Customs and Revenue so so he, he was eating the Queen's <laughs> cucumber sandwiches while in theory sort of theory <laughs> owing a half a million quid and um we wrote about this chap, and uh, he was you know, in touch straight away with the local paper saying that this was all lies and he was going to sue us. And when somebody does that locally, they're doing it so that the local paper or the local website and the local community will think it's all balls and um, he's put these scandal mongers from London to flight. But, of course, we don't hear anything, and we know it's right. And th that happens quite a lot, and that's... That, that's very. I find that very annoying. I really, I really don't like people like that. Oh, and uh, saying he was going to sue us and not suing us. Um, I think about a week later he actually resigned from the council and oh. stood down. And um, he's had to sell his Porsche. I heard yesterday as well. That's very, very sad. Tim Minogue there, and if you do want to find out with Christmas coming whether your councillors have been naughty or nice, you can see on the map. Just go to private-i.co.uk forward slash councillors. So we now move on to the third in the triptych. You may have noticed that there has been a uh, little provincial election in America recently, and it's provoked a great deal of discussion, particularly the aspect of fake news. You will have seen that places like Facebook have been putting up a lot of stories of dubious veracity, let's say, and uh, many people think that it may have swung the election one way or another, uh, namely in the direction of Donald Trump. Now, Private Eye obviously publishes a lot of not fake news, but spoof news on its pages. But when you get online, we have discovered that this can lead to problems. Here is Jane McKenzie once again, talking about fake news, spoof news, and the importance of actually distinguishing between them. 
sometimes things get shorn of their context if they're clipped out of the eye and and appear often sometime later on social media. Uh, And then people with no British context at all and no sense that this has come out of private eye see a, a cutting from the eye perhaps appear in their Twitter feed and uh, find it completely convincing as a a news story. Well, I found this rather depressing because you get used to people saying, well, you know, that's not funny. But them not even to realise that it's meant to be funny is somewhat depressing. So the idea that you do a me and my spoon and people go, oh, he actually likes those spoons, does he? Or he doesn't like that. That is... That is quite lowering. So we had a piece, a joke piece, by Herbert Gusset, who's one of the eye's long-standing characters. Yes. yes. Um, who's kind of a retired it was, colonel. It was one of his letters to the Telegraph. That's it. It was when people were saying that uh, Idris Elba was going to be the next James Bond. And Herbert Gusset is saying, well, this is outrageous to have a black James Bond. James Bond's not black in the books, this kind of thing. And it's a, it's a very, very stupid letter. I remember it particularly because I think I wrote it. And then... People started sharing it on Twitter and That's saying, right. this old British guy's outrageous. And one particular um, American celebrity, I believe he's a sports show presenter, um, retweeted it. I think he got the joke. However, his followers didn't. And there was a massive barrage of, of very angry um, Americans saying, how dare this British guy be so uh, outraged about a black band? That's my worst American accent. <laughs> <laughs> Even worse than my Herbert Gusset impression. And this is not the first time this has happened, is it? No. Um, there is a cutting from quite a, a few years ago, Private Eye now, which the headline was, Diana was alive hours before she was dead which appears in dozens of classic collections of stupid headlines local papers and papers have run around the world, uh, all, all unaware that it was a joke in the first place and not a real headline at all. I mean, I have to say I've had a lot of letters this week saying you made up all those letters from Leavers um, who are furious and are cancelling their subscriptions. They're obviously parodies. Why are you doing this? And my problem is, is trying to work out why people would write fake news stories. I mean, I suppose just for the hell of it. It's hugely profitable. Uh, A lot of people who write fake news, I'm sorry to break this to you, actually earn more than people who write real news. Well, that's uh, incredibly depressing. (laughs) I ran a cartoon last issue, which was a father reading the Daily Mail, looking over at his son's iPad and saying, I hope you're not reading fake news. I mean, I know certain purveyors of fake news are paid a great deal of money, but I didn't realise it was just sort of factories full of people sitting there writing stuff that isn't true. Is this possibly worth branching into? Yeah, maybe it's obviously another good commercial opportunity. So now, in the aftermath of the American election, and in, at a time as well when fake news is kind of everywhere online, and it can yeah. be quite well disguised, yes. there are whole websites devoted to very carefully looking like real news but publishing crazy stories, which I've been fooled by myself, you know, hand on heart. But th- there is a, an attempt to fight back against this kind of thing, isn't there? Yes, I mean, there, there is this sort of clear division between the this is just fake, made up sort of political accusations and, and the sort of numerous sort of similar idea to Private Eye of, of putting something so preposterous nobody will believe it's true kind of um, sites out there. Um, we have been put on a list of banned websites, I believe. Yes, this is, this is what's happened. A journalism professor at a uh, college in Boston has made a list, I believe initially only for her own students, with a kind of, these are the sites to doubt when you see them pop up in your own Facebook feed. And there's a lot of the kind of political extreme sites in there. I, th- I think the list includes sites from both the far left and far right in the States, various other sites that have joke pages, and then these kind of just basic click farm sites. And stuck right in the middle of this list is is (laughs) private-i.co.uk. I do think, however, that we've managed to get ourselves removed now from this academic list. I think by the the rather sophisticated um, technique of ringing up and saying to the academic in question, oh, come on, I don't really think we should be on this list. So I think we're no longer blacklisted as a purveyor of robotic fake stories. Is there anything that can be done about this? So Facebook are looking at, you know, investigating, but they don't seem too keen to get involved. Well, Facebook 
um, and sort of Facebook add-on app type things that allow you to blacklist sites yourself offer is sort of you might be able to take this journalism professor's list and drop it into your personal blacklist. The worry then is that if people are creating curated blacklists, they'll put legitimate sites or very politically skewed lists that you can then blacklist, create your own echo chamber even more than you already can What reading your news via Facebook. Yeah, and it also kind of relies on people to do their own fact-checking for everything they read, which is traditionally the role of journalism is that you kind of outsource the fact-checking to somebody else and you trust the publication you're reading to a greater or lesser extent, depending on whether it's a decent publication or not. Yes, yes I'm afraid I think possibly the only solution is a sort of better reader education of teaching people to some degree that you at least need to consider where you're reading the story from in deciding whether or not it's true. Compulsory reader re-education. You heard it here first. I didn't say re-education. Sounds very Trumpy is all I'm saying. So we haven't talked about Donald Trump very much on the podcast so far. He has made it into the magazine several times, um, but mostly as a sort of rather pathetic figure who owns golf clubs and lies about them in northern Scotland. I think Private Eye was remarkably prescient. I mean, he was given an honorary degree by Robert Gordon University in 2010, and we managed to get the entire Latin citation. And just to show that um, Private Eye is, is very much at the cutting edge um, of the modern world, I'd like... In Latin. <laughs> I, I would like to read the Latin <laughs> citation in full. Salutamus Donaldus Trumpus, mercator et multibillionaris tycoonus americanus, speculator et investor in hotelii et casini et estatus realis, imprimus Trumpus Turi in Novus Yorkus, monumentum enormus et symbolicus phallicus de systemus capitalismus. Celebrissimi in America per capili ridiculi blondi transplantum, probabilim et per programmus televisualis discipulus. In quod dicat catch phrasus, tu es ignis. Alanis sugaris, albionis equivalens, sed multum porperioris, quam trumpus. Divorcum acrimonis de femina Ivana trumpa, unpopularissimi in Caledoni, propter vult constuere cursum golfum, massivum in Aberdeen shire. Et consequente populi Caledonii trumpus odiantam. Incredibabile dicit, ut vult carere per presidente stati uniti, anno domini MM X11. That's 2012. Gaudiamus igitur. Ian Hislop there. Thanks to him, Tim and Jane, and as ever, Matt Hill for producing. We will be back in the new year with more Page 94. But until then, don't forget that issue 1432 is out now and it features, among other things, our election special, like all the election predictions that were so wonderfully wrong. Also, Melania Trump's diary, as told to Craig Brown. And of course, the really big story of the fortnight, the review of the new Zayn Malik book. Thank you very much again for listening and goodbye.